There are so many important people to recognize, President Carter and Mrs. Carter, the executives of various denominations who are Baptist, who are here. Uh, the most important person, uh, my wife, is here, and my pastor, uh, Al Campbell, from Mount Carmel Baptist Church in West Philadelphia. Would you please give him a hand? We're supposed to preach Jesus Christ. There's no question about that. The question is, which Jesus should we preach? In the book of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul raises this issue. Beware of those who come and preach another Christ other than the one that was delivered unto you. You say, what do you mean, another Christ? Well, that's easy to answer. It seems to me that all across America, people have created a Christ that is very different than the one revealed in the Bible. He's a cultural deity. He is an incarnation of our own traits and values. George Bernard Shaw once said, God created us in his image, and we decided to return the favor. Because as I go across the country, the Jesus that I hear more often than I want to admit comes across as a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, middle-class American. And the Jesus of Scripture is different. Not that he has anything against middle-class Americans, I hope not, but the reality is that the Jesus of Scripture comes to challenge us, challenge us to conform to a different image. He challenges us individually, he challenges us as a church, he challenges us as people of the world. He challenges us vocationally. I teach at Eastern University, and one of the things that I try to communicate to our students is that the Jesus of Scripture challenges us to live radical lives and to not conform to the cultural values of the society in which we live. It's a, it's a consumeristic culture. And what's worse is I think we as adults often drill into the minds of young people the values of the culture rather than the values of Jesus. We tell them to go to school, get a good education, get a, go to college, go to university, get a good education. And if they ask why, I know what we tell them. If you get a good education, you'll get a good. And if you get a good job, you'll make a lot of. And if you have a lot of money, you'll be able to buy a lot of stuff. That's what it's about. It's about stuff. Please don't argue with me. We just came through Christmas. Your problem was not, where do I get the money to buy presents for the people I love? Your problem was this. What do I buy for people who have everything? The answer to that's obvious. What should you buy for people who have everything? But you haven't got the guts to pull it off, have you? You haven't got the guts to come down Christmas morning and say, nobody is getting anything because everybody's got everything. No, you will go to the department store. You will walk up and down the aisle. You will search. And because you are Baptist, you will even pray that somebody somewhere invented something that nobody needs so you can give it to the person who has everything. You say you're making this American middle-class lifestyle seem absurd. I mean, we don't have money to, to buy the things that are important. We don't have time to spend on the things that are important. We don't even have time to raise our children. Please don't get the idea that I'm suggesting that women should be the sole raisers of children. I think raising children is a biparental responsibility. But I remember when I was on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, there would always be at these cocktail parties that they would run somebody that would get my wife, one of my colleagues, and say, and what is it you do, my dear? And my wife, who is the most articulate person I know, said, what do I do? 
I am socializing two homo sapiens into the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might be the instruments for the transformation of the social order into the kind of eschatological utopia that God willed from the beginning of creation. And then she said, and what is it that you do? And the other woman said, I, I teach sociology. You know, what, people, there's nothing wrong with being in the vocational world, but raising children is a divine and holy calling, and we are so busy trying to get enough money to buy stuff we don't need, we don't have time to raise our children. We have to get our values straightened out. I tell my students that they have to commit their lives radically to Christ. I, I had a student who came through Eastern, Brian Stevenson, graduated near the top of the class, African-American, only all-American soccer player we ever produced. He went from Eastern on to Harvard, Harvard Law, graduated near the top of the class. He could be making a half a million dollars a year, a million dollars a year, African-American, graduate of Harvard, top of the class. He's living in a run-room flat in Montgomery, Alabama. He makes a minimal salary, and every day, Brian Stevenson goes down to the jailhouse and defends the people on death row. And if you ask him, do you believe in capital punishment, he says, how can you believe in capital punishment in a society where there's two kinds of justice? One kind of justice for rich people and another kind of justice for poor people. And if you don't know that, you don't know much. He said. You know why people go to the electric chair, not just because they might be guilty, but because they're poor. And they have no one really good to speak for them when they have their day in court. And then he said, except in Montgomery, Alabama. Because in Montgomery, Alabama, Doc, I'm the voice of the poor. I speak for the poor. And then he said, and Doc, I'm good. I'm really good. And I thought to myself, Brian, you don't know how good you are. You didn't sell out to the system. I had another student. He went with me to Haiti. We were up in this medical clinic that we have down there, and there was one doctor, two nurses, 300 kids lined up. They could take care of about 60 of them. The rest had to be turned away. This young, brilliant student said, watch. I'm going to come back. I'm going to be a doctor in this place. I'm going to complete my education. I'm going to be a doctor in this place. Just you wait and see. Well, I ran into Charlie in New York. He did become a doctor. You know what he's doing? Cosmetic surgery. Not the kind that makes sense. You put a broken face together after an accident. That makes sense. He's doing the kind of cosmetic surgery that caters to a sexist culture that evaluates women by the shape of their breasts. You know what he's doing. And he's making a lot of money. And he tithes. Oh, isn't that cute? And I listened to him as he bragged about what he was doing. And finally, I said, Charlie, stop. Stop, Charlie. Charlie, you were going to do something magnificent with your life. You were going to go and spend your life in a place where you would be desperately needed. And look at you, Charlie. You sold out. Look at you. You traded in the dream and the vision for what? A jacuzzi and a Porsche. You're a sellout, Charlie. You're a sellout. You say you're going hard on him. Not any harder than Jesus went on the rich young ruler. He did say to him, you want to be my disciple? Sell what you have. Give to the poor. Take up the cross and follow me. When the disciples heard that, you say, are you expecting us all to do that? I mean, you've made it really difficult for rich people to get into heaven. They often accuse me of saying things like that. But making it difficult for rich people to get into heaven is not my line. It's his. You say, you're making it sound like it's, it's terrible to make a million dollars. Oh, no. I want you to, every one of you to go out and make a million dollars. But there is something wrong with keeping it. 
My Bible says in 1 John 3, 17 and 18, if you have this world's goods and you know of brothers and sisters and children who are in need and you keep what you have while they suffer, how can you say, I have the love of God in my heart? Heavy question cannot be evaded. At Eastern, we've started a graduate program because I love to go around the other universities and other colleges and get people to come to our graduate program where we train people to start small businesses and cottage industries in third world countries. I remember the first little business we started. It was in, in a slum called Guachapita outside of Santo Domingo. We, we got about 20 women together and put up a factory to make sandals out of worn out discarded automobile tires. We gave the children of Guachapita 50 cents every time they brought us a worn out discarded automobile tire. People, it wasn't long before we had every worn out discarded automobile tire in Santo Domingo. Then we started getting a lot of new automobile tires. Do you believe in a God that works in mysterious ways his wonders to perform? Over the years, my students have gone out from this specially designed graduate program to third world countries and in groups like, like Opportunity International and World Vision, they have created over the last 20 years over three and a half million jobs for poor families in the third world. Now, that's a lot of people. The president of the World Bank gave us an award contending that if we keep our present growth rate in line by the year 2015, we will have cut into world poverty by 10 percent. People, we can make a difference, and we've got to challenge a generation of young people to not waste their lives on a consumeristic culture, but to commit themselves in radical obedience to a Christ that comes and says, Follow me, come, and die for me. For if any man would be my disciple, if any woman would be my disciple, let that person take up a cross. Let that person deny himself, deny herself. You say, you are really going on heavy. One of my students who is into this radical lifestyle was dragged into my office by his father, and he started yelling at me and telling me that I had put a trip on his son, telling me he had to surrender his whole life to Jesus and all of his wealth. and He said, don't get me wrong, Cam Paulo. I believe in Jesus. I said, do you believe in what he says? And he says, for the most part. But isn't that true? We all talk about believing the words of Jesus, and we are so anxious to define ourselves as evangelicals who believe the Bible to be an infallible message from God. Well, there's a problem here. Do you really believe that Jesus meant what he said, or do you think he was just kidding? He did say, forsake all and take up the cross and follow me. I wrote a book some years ago, and it's still in print primarily because it angers people. There's a chapter in there that always elicits a negative reaction. It's simply entitled, Can a Christian Own a BMW? I know what you're going to say. For a minute there, I thought you were going to say Mercedes. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this. If Jesus was among us and had to buy a car because you have to in, in Atlanta, what kind of car would he drive? I mean, a BMW is designed to do 250 miles an hour on the German Autobahn. Why would you buy a car that would do 250 miles an hour on the German Autobahn if you live in Georgia. What's the speed limit here? None of the ministers know. <laughs> we're not under law, we're under grace. <laughs> the reality is that this is a car that costs like $80,000. But you see, a BMW is much more than a car. You know and I know what it really is. It's a what? It's a status symbol. Can you imagine the Jesus of whom it is said, he who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, a slave, doulos, and made himself of no reputation and humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Can you imagine him having to choose between feeding starving kids in Haiti 
and buying a BMW say, forget those kids, I'm buying me a status symbol. You say, Campolo, you're going to start raising questions about the clothes that we wear, the houses we live in. Of course, to be a follower of Jesus is to question every expenditure of your life. It's about time we realize this. We need to send our kids out with a vision of radical commitment. We need to call them to a radical lifestyle. We cannot give this cultural Jesus that legitimates the normative, comfortable way of life that has been prescribed by the dominant culture. The problem with this age, of course, is that young people don't have any good songwriters anymore, except for Bono. I like Bono, because he talks about the right things, the things that the church should be talking about. I mean, the Bible talks about him. It says, if my people do not speak out, if my disciples do not preach, the very rock stars will cry out. <laughs> Your kids should go to school. They should get a good education. But the reality is this, that the purpose of an education is not to have the credentials to climb the ladders of success. The purpose of an education is to become equipped to radically serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? But we can't call individuals to sacrificial lifestyles unless the church becomes sacrificial. I mean, the Jesus of the culture legitimates the building of expensive buildings. I mean, I often wonder about the building programs of churches. Does the Jesus of Scripture really legitimate this institution that spends so much money on itself? I contend that the church is the only club in the world that exists for the benefit of its non-members. And in the end, the question about your church budget has to be brought to the fore. We can hardly say to our young people, sacrifice for Jesus, when they look at a church budget and see that all the money is spent on the church building itself and on the maintenance of the system. It's about time we recognize this. Soren Kierkegaard described sitting in a cathedral on a cushioned chair, the sun shining through the stained glass window, the velvet-covered minister opening a gilded Bible and marking it with a satin marker and saying, if any man would be my disciple, let him deny himself, forsake all, take up the cross and follow me. And he looked around and he said, and nobody was laughing. There is something strange about this something strange about all of this. We need a sacrificial church, a church that recruits people to go and save the world from poverty and from sin. Please note that. We need a church that lives out the calling of God to declare that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's a kingdom says the scripture in the 65th chapter of Isaiah. It's a kingdom in which children do not die in infancy. That's what it says in the 17th verse. 30,000 children die every single day from either diseases related to malnutrition or from starvation. 3,000 died on 9-11. 30,000 die every day, and they never say a mumbling word. They die in quiet despair. The reality is that the time has come to speak to a generation of young people to say this cannot be allowed to happen. A church that says we've got to go into a world and end that. We've got to. Have you seen those pictures from Darfur where they gather up the children who have died during the night and put them in a pile and pour gasoline over them and burn their bodies? and they do it every day? Does it mean nothing to you, says the Book of Lamentations, O oh, ye who pass by? Children do not die in infancy. Old people live out their lives in health and well-being. And there are so many old people who have to choose between buying medicine on the one hand and buying food on the other. I'm walking down Chester Street in Philadelphia, and there's this old bum, staggering towards me, homeless man, dirty and filthy, holding in his hands a, a, a 
glass, a, a cup of McDonald's coffee, and he spots me, and he says, hey, mister, you want some of my coffee? Filthy, dirty man, the beard had, filled with soot had already covered the cup. I, I knew the right thing to do was to affirm his generosity, so I took the cup, and I took a sip, and I gave it back to him. I said, you're being generous, giving away your coffee to strangers, to people you don't even know. What's gotten into you today, fella? He said, well, the coffee today was especially delicious. And I figure if God gives you something good, you ought to share it with people. I thought, oh no. This sucker has set me up. It's going to cost me $10. I said, you want something from me in return, don't you? He said, yeah, I want a hug. I was hoping for the $10. He put his arms around me, I put my arms around him. Then I realized something, he wasn't going to let me go. People are passing on the street. I'm embarrassed, I'm hugging a dirty, filthy man. And then I heard a voice echoing down the corridors of time, saying, I was hungry, did you feed me? I was naked, did you clothe me? I was sick, did you care for me? Campolo, I was the bum you met on Chesson Street. Did you hug me? For whatever you do unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you do to me. The same Christ who died on Calvary to deliver us from our sins, the same Christ who invades us to transform us from within, this same Christ waits to be encountered in those who are poor or desperate in need, those who wait to be encountered. In the kingdom, children will die in infancy. Old people will live out their lives in dignity. Uh, people will have decent housing. Read it, read it. it. They will have jobs. They will, the environment will be saved. They will not hurt the earth anymore, it says. What a kingdom. What a kingdom. Jesus has called us to do this, but it's not going to happen. I mean, if all we're doing is playing church and worried about how many people join our congregations, if all we're worried about is whether or not we can maintain the institutions, we're not going to be the church that Jesus Christ has called us to be. We have to be a people who are the body of Christ. You see, the same Christ who was for everlasting to everlasting, as we heard last night, the same Christ that was born in Jesus 2,000 years ago, ascended into heaven, and when he left, he said, I'm coming back and I will be in you. And the work that I do, ye shall do. And greater works than these shall ye do, because ye are going to my Father. Now, when Christ was incarnated in Jesus, he could only connect with one person at the time, Matthew or Mark or Mary or Martha. But if Christ was in the five or 6,000 people who are here this morning, if Christ was alive and every, you say, wait a minute, I believe that Christ was incarnated in Jesus, but you are not suggesting that Christ is supposed to be incarnated in us. You're not going to say that we are the body of Christ. That's what the Bible says. You say, but it's not the same. It says in the eighth chapter of Romans that the same spirit that was in Christ Jesus shall be in your mortal bodies. Are you ready to surrender? To Christ and allow him to invade you, to possess you, to transform you, and to make you into a church that challenges the world that is into the world that ought to be. We've got to challenge young people. I got to tell you, we got to challenge young people because we're losing them, and we are losing this generation of young people, not because we have made Christianity too hard for them. We are losing this generation of young people because we have made Christianity too easy for them. There is a craving to do something heroic. And we have let them off the hook. Call them to dream impossible dreams, to fight unbeatable foes, to strive with their last ounce of courage, to go where the brave dare not go. We are calling people to do that. But what about older people? I admire Jimmy Carter. I mean, a president that doesn't lie. I'll always remember that about you.
But I gotta do one up on you, Mr. President. Your mother beats you cold. The reality is that this woman, 68 years old, says, hey, I'm gonna go to the mission field. And she joins the Peace Corps and boldly goes, as Captain Kirk would say, where no man has ever gone before. You older people, what are you gonna do with yourself anyway? I know so many of you are retired. And what are you doing, playing golf? A game where you chase a little white ball because you're too old to chase anything else. You've got the time, you've got the money, you've got the health, you've got the opportunity. Rise up, you suckers, and go out and do the work of Jesus. <laughs> Closing thing. Even as we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, even as we reach out to the poor and the oppressed of our age, which is the calling of this convocation, we do have to say this. We must also and above all bring the message of salvation. For man, woman shall not live by bread alone. Amen? That doesn't leave us off the hook. One old lady said to my, one of my students, doesn't Jesus say the poor you will have with you always? And he said, does that mean you're always with the poor? Whoa. Whoa. How much time do we spend with the poor? I mean, not just write out a check, but spend with the poor. Go and be with them and work with them and live among them. And... But in the midst of it all, do we tell them about the Christ who died on the cross to save them from sin and give them eternal life? See, I belong to a black church. This has been a very good congregation, considering you're about 90% white. Nothing against white people. Some of my best friends are white. but you're hard to talk to. Because in my church, the deacons sit up front and every time you say something good, they yell, preach, brother, preach! I would have done much better if I, if I had my deacons here instead of the president. And the women in my church, when you were pumping on all cylinders, they raise their hands and go, well? Well, that doesn't sound much, but man, you get 50, 60 women going, well, every time your hormones bubble. And the men in my church, they yell, keep going, baby. They'll actually stand up and yell that. Keep going, man. Keep going. Keep going. You don't get that in white churches. White people don't yell, keep going. They yell, stop. Stop. <laughs> when I was 19 and started going to Mount Carmel Baptist Church in West Philadelphia, a friend of mine, Clarence Eaton, died, and I went to his funeral. And I never was aware of the glory of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord as I was at that service. I'd never been to a black service before. I'd always been to Italian weddings where they scream and cry and pretend to be hysterical. You've been to Italian funerals. Black funerals, man, this was a happy time. And the preacher was incredible. Old Dr. Hugger got up and for 15 minutes he talked about the life after death. He made it sound so good that halfway through that talk, I wished I was dead. <laughs> then he came down and spoke words of comfort to the family, personal, intimate words. The last thing he did was he went over to the open casket. It was incredible. He preached for 20 minutes to the corpse. You say, what's that like? To preach to a corpse? Ask your pastor, he'll, he'll tell you what that's like. <laughs> he just yelled, Clarence! Clarence! And he said it with such authority, I would not have been surprised had there been a response. He said, Clarence, there were a lot of things we should have said to you, but you got away too fast, Clarence. We're going to say them to you now. And he went down this litany of beautiful, wonderful things that Clarence had done for people. And when he finished, he said, well, that's it, Clarence. That's it. There's nothing more to say. And when there's nothing more to say, there's only one thing to say. Good night, Clarence. Now, don't try this if you're a white preacher, because it won't work. <laughs> he yelled, good night, Clarence. And he grabbed the lid of the casket and slammed it shut. That's powerful preaching. Good night, Clarence. Boom. 
shockwaves went over the congregation. And as he lifted his head, you could see there was a smile on his face. He said, good night, Clarence. Good night, Clarence, because I know. I can do that, see? I, I, I can do that. <laughs> I know God is going to give you a good morning. And the choir stood and started singing on that great getting up morning. We shall rise. We shall rise. And we were up on our feet and we're dancing and hugging each other in the aisle. And I knew I was in the right church, a church that can take death and make it into a celebration through the grace of God. That's the church of Jesus Christ. Go out, preach a Christ who delivers the poor, alleviates the oppressed, and delivers eternal salvation to all who trust in him in faith. By grace, God bless you.